What's up, everybody? DJ Buck back with you here on Move the Sticks. Buck, we are uh, we're getting close, man. Uh, the draft is less than two weeks away. How you doing, man? <laughs> I'm good. I can't believe that it's a week and a half away. Um, it kind of I feel like it kind of crept up on us. Maybe I, I don't know. Maybe because the Super Bowl is longer. I just feel like it's the rush now to get it home. And I find myself on weekends still trying to polish up tape to make sure. Like, hey, who can be the surprises? Who are the people people that we talk about down the line? Let me make sure I have something on them. <laughs> um, just that. So I like I'm yeah. and you're filling my notebook up with all, all kinds of names down near the bottom of the board, which is interesting always. Yeah, it's that time, man. I've been watching all these non-combine guys and just trying to pluck a few out of the pile. Um, so you know, it's like one out of every ten you watch, you're like, oh, something interesting here. Maybe, yeah. you know, yeah. One Start line talking up. yourself into somebody uh, when you get down to this this late portion of the process. Um, yeah, but yeah. I mean, what that's you, what where we're at. Guys, what did you guys do at the end? Like, when would you like with the mm. teams you were with? So we would come in. So in Seattle and Carolina, respectively, we would come in. Like, you know, it's funny because I always felt like Easter fell somewhere in there. So you come in yeah. for maybe like ten days, go home for Easter break, then come back to kind of finish up the rest of the month. Uh, those first two weeks, you're kind of redoing the board. You got all the pro day information. You're putting all that stuff in. Some of the stuff is beginning to trickle in in terms of the background security reports. Uh, you go back for Easter, you come back. Then the medical comes in that week. And then you really get the, the background report. Like now this isn't from the league. This is when your own investigators, everyone has all the other stuff. And this is when you see people mysteriously fall off the board. <laughs> hey, no what happened to? Uh, yeah. You know, um, so this is where we're at. And then, you know, like the last week is make, making the phone calls, make sure you get all the numbers in the, you know, uh, a two numbers, the agent's number, where you're going to be on draft day. Uh, have you had any injuries, any of that last minute stuff? But I mean, pretty much DJ, when we reach this week, the haze in the barn. I mean, we may not be privy, like some of the area scouts may not be privy to what the pick is going to be at the top, but a lot of the work is done. You're just kind of rehashing scenarios and making sure that you're getting ready for the logistics of draft day. Yeah. I remember uh, when I first got into the league, when you're kind of just a grunt, I had to, for the last week, I had to call all the guys on our front board to make sure that the number was correct. So we have all the numbers, their phone numbers in the system. Oh, you, you had to do that? My first year in the league. Yeah. My first every, year in the league. Oh, every area crazy. scout, every area scout had to do, the guys in their area so you get an alphabetical list of the the names in your area no. and you would have to call it or they would just divvy up the the list mm -hmm. hey buck you got pages four through eight okay yeah. you just go through and every day like it's just we might we might have split it up with some of the other guys in house mm -hmm. um but i remember i had a boatload of those dudes that i was calling and then then i had to double check with the agents Mm -hmm. Make sure that this is the right agent with the right player because some of these guys have changed agents and dropped them and all that stuff. So, but like so this so is like annoying. pre this is pre social media and and before these guys had any information. So the player would you know when he, you if you got ahead of it and did it like a week ahead because almost all the teams had to do this. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> but if you're the one of the first teams that called them, they think you're gonna pick them like. Oh, this is my dream to play for the Ravens. Like I'm like, hey, but I gotta call another 50 guys after hanging up with you, man. This is I mean, you know, just making sure we're all uh, just making sure in. You're good. Hey, number, you got a backup number. Where are you gonna be on yeah. draft day? I'm mm -hmm. gonna be with my mom. Is your agent gonna be there? Okay, yep. cool. Thanks. Hey, good luck. Yep. <laughs> on to the that next. Was it. I got that was it. I got I got a bunch of these to go. I can't go home until I get through a certain allotment. So I'm I'm trying to get trying to get these things cracked. A hundred percent. Um so that was spent time doing that. And then as you got to be a little bit more of a veteran, we were, we, we kind of had the rest of the board all set up, but it was for that first pick we would always, and I've told this a million times, but we would always kind of identify wherever we were picking, like it's going to be one of these five or 10 players, you know? So everybody in the room had to do them if you hadn't done them already. And we would just kind of discuss that scrimmage first round it. pick at the, yeah, at the very end. So that was, okay. that was pretty much it. But then we would chill like the scouts, like we'd be done. We'd be in the city. Uh, we'd be in Baltimore or in, in Cleveland or Philadelphia and your work's done. And so you'd have like that week of the draft, the golf tournament. Oh, we no, like we would go to yeah. baseball games or we, like uh, go to like dinners we played so, wiffle ball one year, like randomly. I remember. Oh, okay. Sometimes, ball. sometimes, sometimes guys would do like, uh, they call it like a golf tournament. 
like either day yeah. or two before the draft. They want to get together and kind of it's kind of low key. Like you kind of relaxing now. Like it is all the way done. You just kind of hanging out. Like you get a nice nice meal. I think we we, nice oh, we went over to together. Billick's house in Baltimore. We had we had yeah. we had a tradition of going to his house. And by the way, he's since sold it. But his house, there was a movie in the maybe maybe late eighties, early nineties called Her Alibi with Tom Selleck. And mm-hmm. I don't even remember what the movie was about, but it was shot at the house that Billick bought. And it was right, it was ew, unbelievable. He catered it. So I mean, it was like the nicest shrimp and everything. It was it was nice. nice. It was very nice. nice. It was kind of his way of thanking everybody for, for kind of you know making it through the draft process. He did stuff like yeah, that all the time. He was a good dude. Yeah, I do like like those things because there is that camaraderie part of it, you know, because when you're on the road, man, it can be a lonely existence away from the team. Like you don't really feel like a part of the team. So being in the office for those times, like multiple weeks in a row, you kind of feel like you're a part of the group because yeah. a lot of times you're you're the lone wolf. You're all the way on the West Coast. No one pays attention to, <laughs> to what you're doing. Yeah. And they check in. They see your reports and those things. but um it's, it's it's look it's a it's a different existence but it can be a lot of fun like getting down to that and then when you get the draft day were you were you guys um i guess everyone's kind of liked it were you a suited and booted team like on draft so day? we were uh yeah we were dressed First up day. in baltimore in baltimore we had to dress up a little bit and then uh in uh gosh same same in uh cleveland and then with uh uh with philly trying to remember philly i think was a little more dressed down maybe not as as for me just like a polo or something but i I do uh um i do remember and there's video of it like i used to have my first two years i was maybe even i think i might even have done it when i'd moved out of the office but i was on the phone with chad alexander who's now the assistant gm of the chargers yeah axe so axe would be in new york on the phones and then i would be in the room in the draft room on the phone so once we decided who we're going to pick it's my job to just make sure that that Chad had the right name and spelling and all that. Hey, all make that sure you spell it right. Make sure we get yeah. the card right. Hey, yep. the what I used to love is hey, write these two names down on the card. Mm-hmm. <laughs> we don't know which one we're gonna pick yet. Yeah. Just put these two names on the card and then we'll call you back and we'll tell you <laughs> what we're doing. Oh, there was going through there was teams that, that trust yeah. me, like when you would be on the phone trying to make a trade, um the team that's picking because it used to have them sitting next to each other. And there's, I know I could tell you stories, but like people would write down a name of the player. They knew the team behind them wanted to take and then try and bait them into trading up <laughs> one spot to take the player. So that's always, yeah. always a bunch of shenanigans. Nonsense. Nonsense. Um, but um, today, Buck, I want to, I mean, had fun kind of talking about what we were going, you know, what we had going on during this time in the old scouting days. But I want to, I want to touch on something that you brought to my attention, an article about, bust rate of wide receivers so we're going to get to that first round wide receivers and why there's risk involved and maybe we can learn something uh about what they have in common the guys who haven't worked out and then after that we'll take a break and then i want to uh, i want to hit on maybe some teams that have Mm -hmm. uh maybe a handful of teams we think have to get one specific thing accomplished or they are they're screwed so they got to get one thing uh for sure accomplished in this draft but let's let's start things off why don't you tell me a little bit about this article how you stumbled upon it and what you learned Okay, so DJ, we had that 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 time of the year, and I don't know if you do this, but this is a time where you start reading material because I'm just trying to figure out like you just don't want to miss anybody. Is there something that I miss? Is there a name that I miss? Is there some kind of trend that is kind of emerging that I'm not aware of? And so I find this piece in the Athletic. Uh, Diana Rossini was a part of uh, the group that that came up with it, and was the bus rate of first round receivers, and. The article kind of broke it down in four different categories, but the thing that stood out to me was reaches and bust. And I think it was like since 2011, they had gone through, done all the research and kind of gone through all the first round receivers and kind of put them in a category. And the number was astonishing based on like the reach and the bust rate. It combined for about 63% of those first round receivers were viewed as either reaches or bust. And to me, it kind of, woke me up. I was like, whoa, that's a significant number. Um, given what we talked about the first round, the first round is kind of like a 50, 50 bust rate. Uh, mm-hmm. the way that we talk about whether you can get like a starter, a star, uh, someone that's a fringe player or whatever. But as much as we've talked about the wide receivers and how deep the wide receivers are in this class and it's loaded and all of these things, it kind of brought me back to that point where it is so deep. 
I wonder if people are missing the boat by ignoring the first round and maybe focusing on finding their wide receivers and stuff in the second round where maybe the risk comes down because the, the amount of money invested kind of goes down and it gives you an opportunity maybe to find those value prices because coming from the Green Bay thing, like that's what Green Bay has always done. They've, they kind of stayed away from the first round, but they've been able to find starters that have emerged as star pluses, second, third, fourth round. All right, let's um, let's just do a little project then. Let's go. Let's not let, let's go where we have a little more data. So let's not do last year. OK, so let's mm-hmm. go to 22. And uh, I want to do two different things here. Look at we can say maybe somebody who hasn't worked out in, in, in hasn't been maybe as valued as where they were picked in the first round. And then I want to just just give you the names of the guys who went in the second round to just see what caliber of player mm-hmm. is there um, if you elected to pass on that option. All right. All right, let's jump into it here. Let's go. Right. Uh, so 2022, Drake London, we would say is a hit, right? Yeah. Garrett Wilson's a hit. Chris Olave's a hit. That's three for three on those guys. Bang, bang, uh, James, yep. Jamison Williams hasn't, you know, he's flashed, but coming he's off flashed. the injury. Ended but I can't all. call him, I can't, yeah, I can't call him a thing. He'd be more incomplete, but he wouldn't be a bust because he's not a bust. Flashed. Um, Jahan Dotson, um, I, you know, I think he's, I think he's trending fine. in the right direction. Yeah, he's, he's fine. fine. I don't I think, think they hit home run. Yeah. Um, Traylon Burks has not worked out so far. Um, so that's your first rounder. So let's just let's just say, you know, Williams and Dotson. So I still think four, four, hopeful. Four, two, and one, or something like that. So it'd be like, Drake. We have Garrett, Olave. So that's three for sure's, um, and then that's two solids, and then one who hasn't really. Got it yet? Okay. Yeah, we're worried about it a little bit. So five, uh, five out of six. So then, but if I give you the names in the second round there, and I'll just run through them. It's uh, Wandale Robinson, John Mechie, Tyquan Thornton, George Pickens, Alec Pierce, Sky Moore. Those are your second round picks. None of those really excite me, DJ. No, yeah, not not the sexiest group. No, so none of those really excite me. Let's move back. We'll do this just a few years. Uh, 21, Jamar Chase, home run. Waddle, home run. Devontae Smith just got paid home run. So what we're seeing, at least early on, is those top three guys in those two classes have been home runs. That have yeah, separators. So, yeah, the separators. So, and I think in the order, the contention was, if you draft one in the top 10, they're more likely to hit. It's mm-hmm. the guys that are later, the bottom of the first round, in the teens and 20s, where you have some of that, hmm? Yep. Well, that's that's where we're getting because Kadarius Tony was a miss at twenty. Uh, Rashad Bateman hasn't lived up to where he mm-hmm. was picked there. A little inconsistent. He was twenty seven. So then you go to the second round guys: Elijah Moore, Rondale Moore, Dwayne Eskridge, Tutu Atwell, Terrence Marshall. Um, that's not a great group there either. DJ, you know, man, like not a great group. Oh, so it's man. like, so anyways, we'll, well, let's let's do one more yeah. year, then we'll circle back. Um, so then we go to 2020, which was the huge wide receiver year. Um, Henry Ruggs was the first one. Obviously, nobody foresaw. Well, well and but boy, it's situation. almost it's almost like a almost like you got to give them an incomplete because that's an yeah. off the field thing. But on the with, field, with, uh, with, but a guy who had no no character issues coming out either. So I don't know how yes. you could foreseen that. No, I mean there was no trail, no breadcrumbs to to show you that this is what was going going to happen and i think his i think as a player he was you know he was he was starting to show signs he was going to be pretty good yes yeah he had some big he had some big plays he was showing those things so so we throw rugs to the side yeah put rugs off to the side here uh jerry judy no he's already on another Mm -hmm. team uh but again 15 pick i know another team another team on on a big contract but you're right 15 pick he certainly in denver did not mm-hmm. live up or play up to expectations. He was supposed to be the guy you would think that he would have taken the number one role, potentially mm-hmm. from Cortland Sutton. That never materialized. CeeDee Lamb, home run. Jalen Rager, whiff. Justin Jefferson, home run. Brandon Ayuk, I would say, home run for where he yeah. was picked there, the 25th yeah. pick for sure. So so, so, so the got- guys that missed there, you've got off the field issue uh, with rugs. You've got uh, Rager, he's a little stiff speed receiver. Just never worked out. Just, no. miss, just a misevaluation. Like we just yeah. missed. What we about Jerry missed. Judy? Jerry Judy's the one that I probably have the toughest time reconciling why that didn't work out. I like Jerry Judy. I liked him a lot coming out. I don't know why it didn't work out. Like I, 
I don't know if like fit and scheme. I mean, he had flashes, but you remember the first year he had a series of drops and that had never, well, mm -hmm. I take that back. I maybe ignored the drops that he may have had at Alabama. I think you came back and pointed out like, no, like remember at Alabama, he had a few bobbles mm -hmm. and drops and those things. He had drops that first year, remember? Then the second year he came back and was okay, but it just never really clicked or popped um, for him as a number one. And so, I would say some of his the players, some of his also like scheme deployment and those things, but it never really worked. Uh, was it three, um, two, two different coaches or three different coaches in three years? Yeah, they've been through it. Um, yeah, th three, I think, right? Yeah, three, yeah, three, three, di three different coaches. So we go to the second round that year of that deep class: Michael Pittman, Chenault, KJ Hamler, Clay Pool, Van, uh, Van Jefferson, Denzel Mims. Buck, I'm looking at that going, what we've looked at one. for just a three-year sample size, I'm saying, that, Freck, I'd be more scared to take one in the second round than I would in the first. Yeah, you know, I think I think what what this exercise has done, it sounds nice in theory to talk about the, the second round and third round receivers, but there's a noticeable divide between like the top, top guys mm -hmm. and the overwhelming majority of the guys that were taken in the second round. The guys at the top of the the top of the draft, the wide receivers at the top of the charts, the hit rate on those guys has been pretty good. If you look mm -hmm. at where those guys, particularly if they grade out as a top 10 talent, those guys have all played and played pretty well. You haven't had many errors when you've drafted someone in the top 10 who, who's had that kind of considerable talent. Yeah, it's, yeah, man, it's interesting. And I'm going through the third round and it's not great there. It's almost to me like the receiver position is so deep. Mm -hmm. um of names and everything that like if you get one of the premier guys get one of the premier guys but after that you're almost almost hey i'm gonna take i'm gonna take two of them in in like the fourth and fifth round like fourth through sixth round just take some flyers on some guys in that range so here's the funny thing i had this conversation uh with a longtime personnel executive like this was like a year or so ago and they were saying that with the i guess the explosion of the spread offense at a collegiate level and how the college game is so vastly different than the pro game. It doesn't matter whether you take a receiver in the first, second, fourth, the the bus rate and the challenge of getting them ready to play is the same because mm -hmm. most of these guys have never taken in a play from the huddle. They've all looked to the sideline to look at the placards. They have rarely played in a pro style offense that's required them to run pro routes. And so the learning curve is the same for everybody, no matter where they come in. And it might explain why sometimes we'll see a third or a fourth rounder or a guy like a Puka Nakua emerge while a first rounder or a high second rounder struggles because it, it, it's still the same. So regardless of your talent, the uh, acclimation to the game is a huge transition because the game at the pro level is so different than the collegiate game that we're seeing. So hear me out on this one then if you're if what we're looking at is the guys you take up in the top 10 the premier guys it's a very high batting average right mm -hmm. and if we're saying look what the wide receivers are making Devonte smith's new deal i think is 25 million a year yeah. so if we're gonna say like what's the most bang for your buck while also being somewhat safe right like not missing top 10 top 10 receiver i keep coming back to sitting there thinking we've got teams you know we, we've got arizona We've got the Chargers. We've got the Giants. Four, five, six. And I remember we did the, remember the first yeah. mock drafts we were doing? We were like, we're going to have receivers go four, five, and six. Mm -hmm. And now when you look back on it and you take in this information, it's like, man, that's a not only a great player, it's a great value, and it's a low risk. You better, you better grab them early. Because like as much as we talk about, hey, Arizona, you trade down, get a bunch of picks and this and that, you come back and get your need. The odds suggest that you're not going to fill it, <laughs> that you're not you're not going to get the same kind of player. And it's funny how, like, when you read those names off now, when we're not emotionally attached to them in this yeah. draft class, none of those names were like, "Ooh, yeah. I got it. I have to get him." Uh, Nabil put one name in, like Christian Watson, who who had emerged. Yeah, but he's been ago. good. He hasn't been. Yeah, yeah, like he's he's the only one. But like. I just want to give Nabil like a little credit. He chimed in with his Packer love. So I want to make sure that yeah. it, it was recognized. But I think now when you take away the emotional part of looking at those guys that were taken in the second and third round, maybe um, we overvalue those guys taken. Like, for instance, like yesterday, I spent 
a lot of time looking at Jermaine Burton, right? Yeah. I was looking at Jermaine Burton because I'm trying to figure out like, okay, which of these second or third round guys is going to be the one that gives you the Tank Dale stuff, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm looking at him. I'm like, all right, man, I'm excited. Like he's averaged over 20 yards per catch last year. He's averaging the high teens for most of his career at Georgia, at Bama. He has speed. He has all this other stuff. But I'm like, okay, you give me these second round names. Like what separates him from Eskridge? What separates him from yeah. Sky Moore? What separates him from, you know, some of the other guys that haven't had the, the burst in those things. And I think it requires everybody to do a deeper dive in terms of what really plays, not not what plays at the position, but what impact players are at the position. What are the common traits where you get into impact players that are drafted outside of first round? And can we find any of those guys? We could, Everyone's excited about Puka Nakua. And so now the conversation has been, how are we going to find the next one? But DJ, I've said this and we've talked about it. As much as we love to find the hidden gems in the draft, this league is a first and second round league. It's a league mm-hmm. where when you look at the Pro Bowl list and those things, those lists are littered with typically first and second rounders and really first rounders. And so when we talk about the first round of the draft, you better make sure that you get it right in the first round because those are the guys that are typically going to be the impact players on your team and the ones that last for the longest time in the league. No question. Um, well, that's a fun conversation. It's a great point. I'm glad you brought that up. Uh, fun to dig into that one. Let's take a quick break. We'll come back. We'll identify a couple teams that have uh, a must, a must do list, not a to do list, a must do list. Uh, we'll get to that right after this. All right, Buck. Let's do uh, let's do two teams in each conference. So just mm-hmm. four total teams here mm. of teams that have uh, something that they absolutely must get accomplished in this draft. So if we're going to start in the AFC, I'll give you some time uh, to think here, and I'll give you mine, of a team that that has to get something accomplished. I, I'm going to go to the uh, I'm going to go to the Pittsburgh Steelers here, maybe a little bit Ooh. off uh, off the grid. Um, right. When you look at the Pittsburgh Steelers, they made the two moves, right? You get Russell Wilson, uh, you get Justin Fields, but they they trade Deontay Johnson. Um, you know, George Pickens. It seems like it's been somewhat in the mm-hmm. doghouse, out of the doghouse uh, during his time there. I just look at that and and I go, okay, I, I like, you know, low-cost additions of Quez Watkins and Van Jefferson, but there is not enough here uh, mm-hmm. offensively at that position. There is not enough firepower, especially in the AFC that's as stacked as it is. They, to me, have – and I don't know if it's at 20. You know, we've been talking about offensive line for them potentially at 20, maybe – they go another direction. They need some impact. They need an impact receiver, man. Bad. Mm. So so what I'm hearing is you're saying you want to trot out Brian Thomas Jr. and George Pickens, uh, two long striders. Maybe, yeah, uh, outside with Russell Wilson and launching rainbows and, out there. And so, Justin so, Fields. So, so as we're thinking about it, they talked about being more committed to the running game. We're going to run the football. Arthur Smith comes in there. You think about, okay, let's. how do we build this offense? Even though we're saying Russell may be on a short-term plan, what did Russell have when he was at his best, right? And so then you look at, oh, he had a long receiver like DK Metcalf when he was throwing those deep balls, frying him down the field. He had fast, athletic guys like Tyler Lockett. He had Doug Baldwin who was crafty. He, look, he did a lot with Jermaine Kearse, um on the outside. Like the, He's had some bigger guys. So maybe that is the way the Steelers go, saying, hey, we'll get outside. We can come back and get an interior block, a a tackle or whatever in the second round and be able to do it. Because you're right. This division, we talk about building your team to win a division. This division, the Cincinnati Bengals, look, they have firepower on offense. You're going to have to be able to outscore them when it comes to Joe Burrow. The Cleveland Browns arguably have the best roster in the division. And then you know, look, Baltimore, Lamar Jackson coming off MVP season, they're still looking to flip the wide receiver room to make this offense probably more modern or more pass-centric. You better have enough firepower because you're not going to be able to keep the points down. You got to be able to kind of put points on the board. And I know people are going to say, you guys just did a whole segment on receivers and risk outside the top 10. Mm. But I'm sitting here going, well, there have been some exceptions, and you're hoping for one here. Justin Jefferson um, is a home run of home runs. Maybe you got to go shopping at the same store, Buck. Maybe you got to go back to LSU and and uh, and go grab Brian Thomas if he gets in range. I don't know that he's going to get there. But that'd be awfully hard to turn down, knowing the uh, the lack of firepower they have on the outside. 
Yeah, no, they have to do it because they have Fryermuth on the inside. They have George Pickens, but is he ready to be the, the number one receiver? I believe they moved Deontay Johnson out of there just because, look, he's no longer fit, I would say, maybe culturally. Like there mm-hmm. were some things that kind of emerged, like maybe he and George Pickens just, you know, maybe some of the selfishness, the antics just didn't work for the team. Maybe you just kind of reset the position, try and find another playmaker that you can pair opposite George Pickens. All right, so give me a team here, a team in the AFC. Oh, it has to get one, done? One particular thing they've got to get done. <laughs> could be obvious, could be off the – Buffalo off. Bills. Oh, yeah. The Buffalo Bills. I mean, so here, here's my thing with the Buffalo Bills. Buffalo Bills at the bottom of the first round. Uh, you got rid of your number one receiver and Stephon Diggs. I mean, you really don't have another guy in the building. Gabe, Gabe Davis, Davis is gone. Yeah. yeah, you let him walk out. I mean, last year you brought Dalton Kincaid in, so you you solid at, at tight end, but what are we doing on the outside? How are we going to win? If we're counting on Josh Allen to do Patrick Mahomes-like things, man, what are the receivers that are going to help him do that? You know, because we can't just have him running around making plays and, and, and doing it in a sandlot fashion. They have to find some route runners, some guys that consistently get open and do it. And, DJ, the problem that you have – is you sitting down there at the bottom of the first round? We talked about the bus rate increasingly is increasing significantly when you're in the twenties. And so, if we take Brian Thomas off the board, and we got Ad Mitchell, I mean, you talk about Lab McConkey, you talk about Keon Coleman, or however you want to do it. Who, are, are we confident that we can identify the guy at the bottom of the first round that is kind of like the sleeper pick that's going to emerge as a number one receiver? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it- that's a great point. And I, I think they picked 60, right? That's their second round pick. Yeah. So yeah, I'll be interested to see if they if they go with one of these. They got a lot of holes, man. It's not even just that wide receiver position. There's so many other holes that they've got to fill. I mean, look, it's not only just wide receiver, both safeties, secondary. Um, you lose Leonard Floyd, you need another pass rusher. Um I, I, I don't, be love, honest I don't love I don't love the offensive line. I, I mean, i am be honest with you, a team that is has been hailed as a Super Bowl contender for the last two, three years, you're looking at the roster as presently constructed. I mean, you're almost saying no way. There's no yeah. way they're gonna be able to do it unless they are able to get some blue chip players to come in there because they're strapped from the cap standpoint. And so this is really hard. It's it's gonna be a challenge for Brandon Bean and company to be able to get this one right. Yeah, I'm with you. Um, when I go to another team here in the – let's go over the NFC. We'll each pick a team here in the NFC that has something uh, to get accomplished. This one, I mean, it's not going to be addressed in the first round. But have you looked at the Dallas Cowboys running back depth chart? Mm. Not good. Their starter is not on their team right now. I mean, no, they're gonna right, find- now, right, right now they're talking about Deuce Vaughn. They're talking about having a reunion with Ezekiel Elliott and those things. But – but DJ, I, I, I'm going to say this, and it's, it's common. It has always been the thing for the Dallas Cowboys. When you look at the Cowboys, when they've been at their best, they have stood running back yeah. behind Dak, Dak Prescott. I mean, I mean, you go back to DeMarco Murray, who wasn't with Dak Prescott, but they had a legitimate running back to complement the yeah. quarterback. So DeMarco Murray, Ezekiel Elliott, they have to go and get a bell cow. The issue that I have, I look at this draft, I don't, I don't know if I see one. You know, I don't know if I see one that can come in and, and save the day. And on path today, I was like, oh, yeah, Trey Benson, you know, that, but Trey Benson doesn't have like that kind of pedigree on paper to say that he can be that. I, DJ, I don't know. So if we say they got to get a bell cow running back, if you're pressed right now and they're like, hey, man, you got 15 seconds to pick a running back for the Dallas Cowboys, who would be the pick? I'm taking Marshawn Lloyd. That's who I'm taking uh, from, from USC. And I think, you know, to me, when you look at it, there's a, there's a, four or five of them that are kind of similarly graded Benson's in that mix as well. If you're mm-hmm. Dallas, the, here's the, here's the decision that Dallas is. This is the toughest decision they're going to have to make. They're not going to take one with the 24th pick, but they have to decide 56. They might have their choice of the, any of them, right? Mm-hmm. They get their top guy. Mm-hmm. Did they sit there and say, well, between 56 in the second round, we pick 87 in the third round is the run gonna finish before we get to 87 like say we have five running backs we like yeah they're all there at 56 is there a hope that we get one of them there at 87 or do we get i don't think they can gamble i think they have to take one at 56 i think it has to be a second round pick 
I think they I think they have to position themselves to say, hey, we don't really want to take a, a pick and eat. But in the second round, they have to say we're committed to taking a running back. And depending mm-hmm. on how the draft is breaking, if all of a sudden there's a little run that starts taking place at 45, hey, man, we got to get up. We got to make sure we get yeah. a running back. And I would say this, DJ, I think they need two. I think they have to double up. I think they need to take one in the second round and come back in the fourth or fifth round and take another one. You know, someone that can play. Or maybe you go to the sixth round. They need to see if they can find a hidden gem that can emerge as a guy that can be a legitimate workhorse running back for him. I don't like the committee situation, even though everyone is going to it. I believe they need someone who opponents fear so that can alleviate some of the pressure on Dak Prescott. Yeah, no, it's it's going to be fascinating there. All right, you're the last one here. Give me one more team in the NFC that you think has something that they absolutely must get accomplished in this draft class. Okay, so – my initial inkling was to talk about the Minnesota Vikings and quarterback, but I don't know if that's necessarily true. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm I'm not a Sam Donald apologist, but I feel like they have enough that they should be able to kind of get. If, it if done. Sam can't do it with this group, then it's not going to happen. So, so what's our last hope so, for those of us that are still? This is like it's waving it's, the waving the flag. Was just like this is the last shot here. It's all over. So here's what I'm gonna say. I'm gonna say the Atlanta Falcons finding a pass rusher. Yeah, and the reason why because on paper the Atlanta Falcons look like they should be ready to go with Kirk Cousins. That Kirk Cousins should be able to put this team in a position to get the 10 by himself in terms of like what they have on offense, Bijan Robinson, the running backs, Drake London. Hopefully they'll finally get the ball to Kyle Pitts and they should be able to go. They got Darnell Mooney. So offensively they're good. But to win in this league, if you have a good offense, you got to have closers. I don't know who their closers are. So can they get the closer at pick eight? Can they find someone that can give them double-digit sacks that you can count on? And remember, man, the Falcons, it's kind of been a black hole for pass rushers. They, like, they've they tried this the last three, four, five years. They haven't been able to get it. They have to find a legitimate high-end pass rush. They're picking up there at eight. They're going to have more than likely their choice of any of them. So they're all going to be there for them. Um, they just got to pick the right one. But that I think that's a no-brainer. I like that one. Um, all right, Buck, that's uh, that's all we've got for today. Anything else you want to get into before we get out of here? Man, 10 days, 10 days, week and a half before the draft goes. When do you leave to go to uh, Detroit? Sunday. I think I head out there Sunday, so I'll be out there all week. So I haven't even looked at a weather report yet. I don't know what we're looking at. I guess it could kind of go either way, uh, that part of the country during this time of the year. So hope for, hope for the best there, I'll tell you that much. I will say I've, I've changed over the years. I used to uh, I used to go full suits at these things and then I realized there's the days are so long and you're sitting at a desk the whole time. So I've kind of more, I mean, not like jeans, but the, you know, more of those athletic pants, you know, like golf pants. You know, that's so. I went to the store this weekend, loaded up on a couple more of those. Oh, I got okay, I got comfortable shoes, gotta have the comfortable shoes, comfortable pants, and then everything up here is, is business. We're, we're, we're relaxed down below. Yeah, we're, we're, uh, we're TV anchor man. Yeah, we're TV anchor man. We're sports anchor uh, uh, in a K- KKL, <laughs> yeah. we're, we're, KTLA. We're doing it. We're making sure that hey, we look the part up top. But don't comfortable be comfortable long day super long day super uh, long day so it should be fun uh, yeah looking forward to it all right hope you guys enjoyed this one uh we appreciate you leaving those uh ratings and reviews uh especially during this time of year getting the word out if you haven't done that already we encourage you to do so uh we will see you next time we've got uh, a couple more episodes coming this week we've got uh i've got a conference call episode buck and then we've got our friend mm-hmm. times is going to join us uh so three episodes this week move the sticks so appreciate everybody hanging with us and we'll see you next time right here